it's a real delight to be able to uh, introduce uh, Professor George Blabidis and uh, uh, Dr. Dario Moreno to talk to us today about the birth cohorts. Um, I should just say at the outset, and you may have seen a, a note, but the, uh, this will all be recorded. Um, so it will be available afterwards as well. Um, George is Professor of uh, Population Health and Statistics at UCL and Director of Research at the Center for Longitudinal Studies. And he leads, uh, co-leads with Jay Dasmunchi the work on cohorts as part of the Center for Society and Mental Health. And Dario is a postdoctoral research associate here who's recently just joined us um, at the Center who's working with George and Jay in that platform of work. Um, so George and uh, Dario will talk for around about 50 minutes in total, and there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end of it. Um, and if you want to ask questions, I think we can, you can either put them into the chat or um, put up your hand at the end and uh, I'll try to get to you. So we'll, we'll try to work it out. It depends on how many people are here and, uh, and what the easiest way to do that is. So with that, it's a pleasure for me to hand over to George and Dario to talk to us about the and, and to provide an introduction to the birth cohorts. Thanks very much, George, Dario. Thank you so much, Greg. It's great to be here and great to see so many uh, colleagues participating in the seminar. This is the most stressful bit of me sharing the screen uh, for trying to find presentation and everything. So, yep. Can we all see this? Hopefully, yes. I can find this. Okay, so spotlight. Presentation from beginning, spotlight works. Okay, so um, thank you so much, Craig. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me and Dario to talk about uh, uh, mental health in six British cohorts and uh, talk about some recent findings and present some latest results. Dario will do this and which, uh, you know inform the future direction. Um, before I start, some acknowledgements. The work I will present today is work I have been doing with uh, various colleagues and collaborators. They are in there in uh, first name alphabetical order, um, first name based alphabetical order. So, but of course, any errors or omissions in the presentations are all mine and nothing to do with uh, uh, my wonderful colleagues um, that are their names you can see there on that slide. So today, um, what we'll, uh, me and Dario will be talking about today. First, I will give a brief introduction to British cohorts uh, including the national birth cohort studies. Um, that's the first part of uh, the talk today. I will move on and talk about discuss, discuss present on measurement properties of mental health measures uh, in these cohorts. Um, this is what we have been doing um, for many years now, many, I mean, for the last four or five years at least. Um, and I think it's important work in the sense that it allows us to understand measurement properties of mental health measures and allows us to do uh, a hopefully interesting substantive work. The next part of the, of the talk will be about recent findings on early life mental health, mental health over the life course, trajectories. And I will briefly present some, in some uh, findings on mental health at the early stages of the pandemic. This is where Dario will take over uh, to present what I think is very interesting work, hot of the press data uh, results uh, on mental health and related outcomes during the pandemic. And in the end, we will uh, summarize the whole talk and then uh, we will do our uh, Q&A uh, session. So the British birth cohorts. Now, um, this is a slide. Now, this, is, this slide um, says the headline there is, is, is talks about the UK's longitudinal studies. This is not all of them. This is some of them, but it, it kind of handily includes the six cohorts I will be uh, talking about today. I mean, not all our results and not all our slides will be about all the six cohorts, but all the six, six cohorts are used in, in one way or another. They, four of those, uh, you, you can see that these cohorts span a, a, a great amount of time, right? The first one, the 1946 British birth cohorts are in 1946. It's a representative sample about a little bit more than 5,000 participants. Then the 1958 British birth cohort, uh, a bit more than 70,000 participants, another gener participants, another generation. 1970 British birth cohort, uh, national birth cohort as well, 1970. And then the millennium cohort, which this up until now, these are the four national 
birth co co cohorts we have. The good news is you may have seen that there will be at least one new birth cohort and there is a feasibility study for a, another UK wide birth cohort. So we might have more. So this slide will expand and at the right hand side, you get a bit two more national birth cohorts. In addition to those, there are of course other very important longitudinal uh, surveys, but today I will be using data from the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children, ALSPAC, which is a birth cohort around the Bristol area. Uh, it's not a national birth cohort, but um, it's a birth cohort in a specific uh, region. Um, and next steps, it's a study, uh, it's not a birth cohort, but it's a cohort of uh, participants born in the late, in 1989, 1989, 1990. And it's also uh, hosted at the Center for Longitudinal Studies where I work. And it's not a birth cohort, but a cohort from uh, early life onwards. From what you can see in this slide, I mean, I, I think, it, it must be uh, obvious is that the information we have spans a lot of decades and vi various generations and at different life stages of, uh, of their life course. So one thing that uh, we can start thinking about is about macrosocial trends and rational differences and so on. However, traditionally, um, birth cohorts have been used as standalone type of studies, usually. This has changed, I guess, in the last uh, five to 10 years. And this is because birth cohort studies have this unique advantage. The, we have data from preconception sometimes or, or birth ac across all stages of the life course. And this is you know, a, a slide from Public Health England that kind of showcases the life course perspective, the life course approach. The great thing about birth cohorts is that the representative, large, rich studies where we have all this information across all the stages of the life course. So we can answer questions that cannot readily be answered, cannot easily be answered with other scientific designs. For example, if we're interested in uh, the, the impact, the impact of early life characteristics or circumstances on adult outcomes, birth cohorts is perhaps the only design that can actually deliver this. Or if we're interested in comparing um, the impact of, of different life stages on various outcomes, again, birth cohorts is the only design that can offer, can answer this type of this type of questions. And, you know, there is, a, of course, a lot of theory within the social sciences and in epidemiology uh, that actually backs up the approach. Uh, and I must say in the, in the last 10 or 20 years, a lot of methodology, we will speak a little bit about this in this uh, seminar, has been developed on how best to answer all those questions. So this is the life course approach and we have various cohorts and so on. Um, but how do they look like? Uh, across age and calendar year. So now in, this is, this is, this represents five of the cohorts, four of the national cohorts plus next steps. Uh, the dots, the bullet point, the dots you see there are the actual face-to-face -face, um, sweeps, data sweeps where uh, our participants were contacted and we have data from our participants. So you see now in demography, this is, this is called a Lexis diagram because you have a combination between age Calend calendar year, so you can start thinking about age period and cohort effects. Usually, um, if you look at the data, for example, from the Office for National Statistics or other data, this type of Lexis diagrams are constructed with cross-sectional data, creating pseudo cohorts. In the UK, we're very, very lucky. It's the only country in the world that has this feature. We actually do have population-based representative samples that actually track actual cohorts over their life course. So we can create this Lexis diagram and, and start thinking about interesting between cohort comparisons. I will speak a little bit about later on. That can be very informative on various things, among others, understanding social change, demographic shifts, and so on. With actual data, actual cohorts, not, not, not having to create pseudo cohorts from cross-sectional data. And you can already see from there, from these bullet points where they overlap, where some of the comparisons, direct comparisons can be made and so on. However, this is not, only what we only have. Um, COVID-19, the, the pandemic happened, of course, we all know that, right? And um, what we did uh, in this cohort, we embedded web surveys during the pandemic. And so the major aim of this was to understand the economic, social and health impacts of the COVID-19 crisis, the extent to which is widening or narrowing inequalities, which is very important. And the most importantly for the cohorts, because it's the only design that can actually answer this question, the lifelong factors would save vulnerability and resilience to the effects of the pandemic. And the idea about the lifelong, fact, lifelong factors is, is important because when we do this service, when we're embedding uh, new surveys 
within long-standing uh, data collections, um, there are two benefits. The first benefit is that we can understand where to what extent life course histories of various things, including mental health, which I will give an example later on, how life course histories have shaped uh, outcomes during the pandemic. We can also understand these cohorts will have future sweeps, uh, future data collections. We can understand the social, economic, and health impacts of the pandemic in the future and how these are modified by previous life course history. So there is embedded those web surveys into existing uh, long-standing data collections has a lot of advantages compared to other surveys that were sent alone surveys that are great and they can answer various very important questions but they lack the existing data now a little bit i will just speak a little bit about our web survey um, so we have three sweeps in five of those cohorts um, may september and march um, the first one was web-based only the second uh, was uh, web-based but with some incentives and so on and the third one was web plus telephone don't response at uh we have with counterintuitive but if you if you if you look at the user guide that we have information we have available the our approach on the design led us to actually have to increase our sample to, to about 20, 27,000 from 18,000 during the first sweep. So the, the, these are three sweeps of all these cohorts during the pandemic, of course, embedded in the uh, in the long-standing data we have from all the previous stages of the life course. Now, I mentioned before that there is there are advantages in terms of the science of the questions we can answer when we embed uh, uh, specific COVID-19 specific surveys into long-standing uh, cohorts, but there are also some methodological advantages. The most important of those has to do with uh, missing data, selection and attrition. And if all web surveys, but all, there's no exception, uh, were selective. All web surveys during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic were selective. Um, there was selective at non-response. We know that, uh, there's no argument against it. Now having available all the rich information uh, from the previous stages of the life course allows us to do to actually use this rich information and correct uh, for this selective response non-response or response or attrition if you want to call it attrition in the web surveys and it allows us to restore sample, sample representativeness for example i have just one example here on our uh, from our web survey uh, what you see, you see there the gray the you see the uh, the five cohorts uh, starting from uh, the 1946 cohort and going up to the millennium cohort this prevalence of females that that's the gray the gray bar with the point estimate this is what we know from the baseline sweep birth sweep of all, or the first sweep of all these surveys we know this is the true percentage the true prevalence the red bar is what we get from our surveys without any correction for selective attrition or non-response and so on and you will see that maybe in the older cohorts, there's not much selection, but when you go to the more recently born cohorts, there's a lot of selection. We are, we're getting more, more percentage of fem more higher prevalence of females than we should be getting. But the blue bar represents the corrected for attrition uh, percentage prevalence. Uh, in this case, this is done with the inverse probability weighting, can be done with multi imputation and other methods as well. Uh, the weights were derived by using the rich information uh, from the previous uh, sweeps of our of all the studies, and you will see that with the blue bar, we are able to restore sample representativeness. And there are other examples how actually with the previous information we have, we can restore sample representativeness. And this is very important because it's not only about the, the questions you can answer with all the life course data we have; it's how this data can help us methodologically with the important issue of selective attrition. Just very quickly to say that there's a, we have done a lot of work on this and a lot of information. We have training seminars, training training uh, webinars in, in, in this uh, as we speak. Hopefully, that in sometimes in the future it will be it can be face to face. Uh, there is this, this recently published paper that has all information about our approach um, and also links to our user guides and so on. And this is the user guide of the web survey with all more information and more example about restoring sample representativeness than uh, than the one that I just presented. So moving on, just to finish the presentation, the very brief introduction to the cohorts, uh, I just mentioned before about the rich information these cohorts have. Well, 
This is just an example on this slide about the information we have over the life course from birth to during school years, adult life, and so on. And you see, there, there is all sorts of uh, dimensions, characteristics available. Um, of course, as we move on from birth to school years and adulthood, these things, some things are remain the same, but some things change, some things, new things are added. One important thing to note is that these cohorts are not just surveys. Of course, we have surveys, but it's much more than that. So this slide includes a lot of buzzwords, right? Including genetics, epigenetics, and so on. And you may be thinking, okay, this is a, something to gain to get our attention, but actually, no, it's it's the actual data we have. This, so these surveys, for example, they're fully genotyped. You can use polygenic risk scores to in, investigate, for example, uh, gene environment interactions, let's say, for example. We have also information epigenetics. There are various linkages on education data, host, hospitalizations, hospital records, geographical linkages, and so on. Uh, linkages um, on employment and various other things. So it's not only the data points that we have on the actual surveys when we contact our participants, we also have information that links those time points, right, with all the things that I just mentioned. So these are very rich sources of data that are becoming rich by the minute, I must say, okay, maybe that's an exaggeration, but every, every let's say, let's say every year there is a new, either there is a new sweep in some of those cohorts, more or less, there is a new sweep on average every five years, but every year there is a new new linkages, new uh, type of data being available because of all this information which is added, which is not just survey information. And of course, last but not least, I mentioned that these studies are fully genotyped, but we also have blood samples, there are various biomarkers available, and I will give an example on those um, later on, on the links with mental health. Um, the great thing about that, about these studies, uh, the studies that are curated, curated at least from the Center for Longitudinal Studies, where I work, is that all these data are freely available in the UK data service. You can, uh, you have an internet connection, and since you are here today, you have an internet connection. You can go there in the UK data service, create an account, and download the data. There are some, all the survey data are available, so let's say all the mental health data are available, plus all the other things that are asked in the surveys. Plus by markers, of course, there are some things that there is some other process like genetics data, some sensitive data, there is a process, right? You do an application, but let's say 95% of the data are available very with very, very easy data access through the UK data service. That's not to say that genetics or the other data are not easy to access, they are, but there is some process because of the sensitivity uh, and related issues. Now, a lot of information on the cohorts on and various things can be found on the Center for Longitudinal Studies website. Coincidentally, when I took this print, when I did that screenshot, uh, there is uh, the first thing that was available on, on this rolling kind of thing on the CLS website was a webinar we do on the COVID, on the COVID ser service and the data, how they can be used. So it's the 9th, 17th of June. I think there are still uh, spaces available. So if you want to join that one. Um, but uh, the CLS website has a lot of information, the documentation and various other things on all the cohorts uh, that are curated from CLS. And other cohorts, let's say the ALSPAC and the 1946 cohort, they have their own websites and you can get information there. Speaking about mental health though, um, a great, great, great and amazing resource on finding out what kind of mental health assessments we have available in the cohorts because some of you may be a bit more familiar with the cohort some of you may be less familiar you may be thinking okay great data but how can i find out about what mental health measures you have available in the cohorts george well louise louise i know with uh, and with colleagues have done this amazing catalog all the cohorts uh, mental health measures all of it are available there so you can easily search and find out not only on the CLS website but through this catalog which is very user-friendly interactive and so on uh, you can find out all mental health uh, measures that we have uh, in uh, in the cohorts, in actually not only in the cohorts, in other longitudinal surveys and so on. Okay, so speaking about uh, measurement, let me just give you a very brief overview of what we're measuring in the cohorts before I dive into a little bit on uh, measurement properties and give you again, and then later on give you some examples of um, of our research. So this is these are some examples of early, early life mental health measures in the six cohorts I will be talking about today. Um, it's not all, there is more, but this is just an, this is an example of the most consistent ones, let's say. You will see that in the earlier cohorts and uh, in the most recently born cohorts, there is a rather or the eight strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which is based uh, on the rather. So there is a lot of comparability there. The MFQ and some other measures. And of course we have, uh, 
These are reported by parents, the mother usually, teachers, and there are some self-reports in ad adolescents or, um, or maybe some studies from age 10 onwards and so on for very early adolescents, maybe or, uh, that's a bit before adolescence. But you get an idea of what we have available. In terms of psychological distress in adulthood, these are the measures uh, we have, uh, some identical ones between cohorts, some different ones between or within cohorts and so on. Just to say, it's not only psychological distress that we are capturing. There's a lot of information on life satisfaction, uh, well-being, quality of life and so on. Plus there are some other measures that are not mentioned in this, um, in, in this matrix, but this is just to give you an idea of the psychological distress measures we have, because this is what I will be giving some examples of recent work uh, later on. So this is what we have in terms of measures, but please either visit the CELES website or uh, visit uh, the, the catalog that Luis has, uh, has, uh, has made available, which is fantastic and amazing to find even more about the mental health measures uh, we have available either in the historic existing uh, sweeps or within the COVID-19 service, because there, of course there's mental health is very important there. And also to mention that there, uh, there are various other mental health outcomes like loneliness, isolation, and so on. So mental health measurement in the cohorts. Now this is work that is me measurement error type of work that we have been doing for a couple of years. A large part of this is within this closer, a closer uh, work package. Uh, which is about harmonization and measurement properties of mental health measures in six, six British cohorts. That work was uh, led by Owen, Owen McElroy and with various other colleagues that we work together on this. And so this work covers measurement properties. I'll give you some examples that I think is important to understand when doing mental health work. Measurement properties and measurement error, well, the corner sort of science, I would say on anything we do on science, important on mental health, important, important on anything we do from uh, experimental physics to sociology and from medicine to anything really. Um, but there is, in addition to this report that will become available in July, um, so all this report and uh, some data, uh, data deposits related to this will become, and some tools, how to harmonize data and so on, will become available in July. It's work we have been doing the last four years. You can find a lot of measurement information, measurement properties on that report. Let me give you some examples of what you can find in there, and maybe some, some resources before July, if you want to find out more about measurement in the cohorts. So measurement properties of mental health measures in cohorts. What generally happens, you may have noticed from the information from that summary of uh, the available measures I have shown um, is that there are there, there, are two, there, there are two dimensions when it comes to measurement, two groups. There, there's the dimension or the, the fortunate to handle when we have identical items and scales within or between cohorts. But even when we have identical scales or items, there, we have to consider some issues related to, that are linked with measurement error. For example, do cohort members interpret mental health questions the same way as they age? So within cohort, as people move on through their life course, do they interpret the same question at the same way? Very, another very important question, are there generational differences in the interpretation of the items? Are there cohort effects? Which is very important. For example, let's say more recently born cohorts um, find it easy, they, they, they interpret those items in a, in a different way and they are more likely to, re, to, to respond to a particular question or vice versa, all, all, of, all of those things. Very important related question is that which is related is whether there are age or generational differences or within cohort or between cohort differences on reliability and precision. And this is a bit of a neglected area that we have done a lot of work on. I'll give an example later on. But that's the easy bit. Because these cohorts are, you know, go back in time, uh, way back in time, right? Um, there were different scientific teams that led the cohort, different questions. The science moved on, let's say from the 670s on, on, on mental health or other things. So sometimes there are different measures between cohorts or even within cohorts. And when this is, and this is an issue, right? And we need to do something about it. We have been doing a lot of work on this on harmonization, which is part of this report. Calibration, which is another approach. These two approaches try to answer the same question, but with different assumptions or measurement error. Now, when we do harmonization or calibration, once this is done, we have to go back and as above, consider all the questions that we have to consider when the items are identical. So there is a lot on measurement error, um, but there are some good news on that. 
this, uh, with all this work and all these differences and so on, all these interesting questions, there are some good news on that, I think, after all these four or five years of, of work. So let me give you some examples of this measurement uh, work before I move on to uh, uh, some examples of actual, uh, actual findings. So this is a paper we published uh, a couple of years ago. And um, what you see on this slide is very simply a measurement model. It's a measurement model of the nine night the malaise inventory. The malaise inventory is a measure of psychological distress, right? So you have these nine items, which is from Y1 to Y9. This is what we observe. And this is the actual level of latent level of psychological distress we want to uh, compare our two cohorts on. So the idea there was to compare the 1940, the, the 1958 and the 1970 cohort in midlife at age 42. And we wanted to ensure that when we compare those cohorts, any difference we're obtaining is not due to measurement error, different interpretation of the questions, social desirability bias, or survey differences, mode effects, and so on, but a true difference if there is any difference in psychological distress. Now, by using this measurement model, this is you can this is a two-parameter probit model. It's used in categorical factor analysis and item response theory. One thing we, think we need to ensure is that these measurement parameters, these lambdas there, these factor loadings, and this threshold, the tau's, function equivalently between groups, which is mentioned here. The lambdas and the tau's has to be equivalent between groups. So this is the, the whole measurement invariance type of literature. There's a lot of literature there in the social science on that, really, really interesting literature on measurement, or very technical literature, I must say. And very interesting, a lot of simulation, a lot of empirical evidence on what these, these models actually do. So we did this when we did obtain uh, what is called scalar invariance. So it allowed us to compare the means, uh, the mean psychological distress in those cohorts. And if you look at the paper, we found that those born in 1970 at, in midlife has, have much higher levels of psychological distress. But this, is, this was good news and it gave us some, it was encouraging because it could have been otherwise, right? For various reasons, that the fact that at this particular age we are we can, we're allowed to compare. We're, we're obtaining some favorable measurement properties of a scale which has been asked in both cohorts, identical and so on. But there is more to that. I mean, if you look at this matrix I have presented before, the, the Malaise questionnaire has been asked in various, in these two cohorts, the NCDS, the 1958 and 1970 cohort, the Malaise has been asked in various stages of the life course. So, um, the next question was, OK, we're obtaining this at age 42, fine. But what happens across cohorts, across all adulthood and across these two cohorts? So we did exactly the same approach, a little bit more complex because we have various other groups and so on. Very interestingly, we, are, we were able to obtain scalar invariance as well, which means these, the, the latent means of psychological distress can be compared. The interpretation of the items of the malaise is similar across cohorts and between cohorts and so on. We were able to replicate this across educational groups, across genders, which was uh, very, very encouraging. And that one wasn't entirely expected because you have various differences, various things that can actually alter, can introduce measurement error there. Now, to give you an example of why this was happening on the parameter level and not just uh, this kind of indices of it that you know might mean something, but actually if it's visualizing the actual parameters, this plot here is visualizing the lambdas, the, the factor loadings for one of the cohorts, uh, for the 958 birth cohort. So you have like this dot is the factor loading estimate for at different ages, 1023, 33, 42, and 50 for each of the nine items. The longitudinal item, the longitudinal parameter is the parameter after scalar invariance. And this, this, what you see there in this picture is that those parameters hang together very, very well. And we get the same with the threshold parameters and with, various other groups and various other cohorts, various other measures. For example, we get a similar picture when we look at the strengths and difficulties questionnaire across time on MCS on the millennium cohort. So, and this is why this, because these parameters hang together, which means the correlation structure, the underlying trait, which gives rise to the correlation structure among other things, allows us to do the comparisons. And again, this picture that those parameters hang together, uh, cluster together, again, is not something that is expected a priori because there are lots of things that can actually make those parameters be different. Um, among uh, not only social desirability and age and uh, generational effects, but also actual things that were different in the actual surveys because they happened 12 years apart from slightly different teams and so on, despite being in the same center and so on. Okay. Um, the last thing I will mention about measurement and that can be found in the report is reliability. Usually, reliability or precision of measurement is captured with. Um, Cronbach's alpha or omega or equivalent 
measures, uh, which is a single number. Now, the models we have used and within item response theory or categorical factor analysis, reliability or precision can be expressed as a function, the scale information function. What this simply is, we can talk about the math uh, uh, in the Q&A, but this is simply, it says Fisher information. We can think of it as reliability. The higher, the better, the more reliability you have, the more precision. And on the x-axis, you have the level of the latent trade, the level of, let's say, psychological distress. So this function tells you at which part, which level of psychological distress in this case, or anything else we're measuring, th this particular scale has more reliability or less measurement error. And this is important because sometimes scales are highly correlated among each other, but they may be capturing different things. One example of that uh, is this is uh, various mental health measures at age, in various ages um, in the 1958 cohort. So you have the Malays at age 23, 33, 42 at age 50, then the GHQ12 at age 42, and the SF36 at age 50. You will see the Malays, and this is zero, which is, let's say, the average level of psychological distress, broadly speaking. You see the Malays measures a bit above the average, as you would expect. The blue line, which is the GHQ12, captures this variation, but is a bit better along average levels of psychological distress. But the SF36 achieves most of its precision a bit below average psychological distress. There is some precision here, but it diminishes as you go further up on more severe, more higher levels of psychological distress. There are various examples on these reliability functions, scale information functions and so on on that report. Um, but I think it's an important contribution to mental health measurement in the cohorts because we're able to understand exactly what it measures actually does. And I think it's important, you will see there are some surprises there in some measures, for example, the SF36, it's not entirely expected that it does well a bit below uh, the average psychological distress. Okay, now you might you may be thinking, okay, George, do we have to wait until July until we have all this information? No, there is already a lot of work out there. For example, all this work on the malaise uh, that I presented is already available in this paper. There is work on uh, uh, on calibration, which is available, and also work on harmonization has informed, among other things, this paper, which was uh, published earlier this year. All of this is already available, but the report will be available in July, so you have all the measurement information in the cohorts, not for all measures, but for most measures that we did. Okay, so measurement, I, up until now, I, I spoke a little bit, I gave a brief introduction to uh, some of the, those six cohorts, um, and then spoke a little bit about measurement properties and the work that we have done on measurement. Let's move on to some recent findings um, before Dario takes over. So, um, I will start with early life mental health. So this is a paper we published recently um, on the association between early life mental health with biomarkers in midlife and mortality, and premature mortality in the FT8 British birth cohort. Early life mental health here means we have, we measured uh, externalizing and internalizing from age seven to 16 at the three time points that are available at seven, 11 and 16. When we, we uh, derived four different groups, the reference group always in this case is uh, those that experienced no externalizing or internalizing symptoms. And then there were three different groups, the adolescent onset group, moderate and stable high. What the finding, the major finding is there is that early life mental health is, is related with both biomarkers in midlife and premature mortality up to age 58, all cause and cause specific mortality. But the association with biomarkers is more, is stronger in females. For example, there is the example of HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol here, where you can see with lower, lower HDL is, the association is stronger in females. Similarly, with abdominal obesity, the association is much stronger in uh, females compared to males. There are some associations, in, for example, in C-reactive protein with our, that are similar between both males and females, but generally speaking, we're picking up associations, heavily fully adjusted associations between early, trajectories of early life mental health, biomarkers, and premature mortality. Biomarkers stronger in females, premature mortality, uh, similar associations between males and females, which is, a, a, among other things, interesting to think about uh, the sex survival, the sex survival paradox, and so on. Moving on, this is a, a recent paper we published on early life mental health and problematic drinking in mid adulthood in the 1958 and the 1970 uh, birth cohort. What you have here, you have the probability of problematic drinking at age 45. Uh, 
and this is externalizing on the left hand side of, uh, of your slide of the screen and this internalizing in the two cohorts stratified by sex you will see on the x-axis you have levels of externalizing problems with higher levels of externalizing we're picking up an association a well-adjusted association so the higher levels of externalizing and the higher levels of problematic drinking however with internalizing in males specifically we're picking up a protective effect and there's a lot of discussion in the, in the paper about methodological issue about suppression regression suppression and appropriate adjustment for these two dimensions but again we're picking up an important uh, association which is again uh, well adjusted and we can discuss about causal inference later on during q a on an important outcome in midlife in two different cohorts uh, in this case is uh, problematic drinking Moving on, this is a paper, this is a preprint uh, led by uh, Ellen Thompson, just to say the preview, previous work was led by Kwan Ng, uh, an ex-PhD student, uh, really, really great work. And this is work uh, led by uh, Ellen Thompson. It's a preprint, but it has been accepted for publication, it will appear soon. Again, this looks at the 1958 and 1970 birth cohort, early life mental health at age 16, looking at various outcomes. The blue line is the 1958 cohort and the red line is the 1970 cohort. The main message here is that we're picking again associations with various social and health outcomes in both cohorts. But if, for example, you look at cohabitation at age 42 with increasing uh, age 16 psychopathology, the lines cross and that becomes the probability is much lower in the 1970 cohort. And you can see this in voting behavior as well. And on age 16 on, and psychopathology measured in various ways at age 42. So we're not only picking up an association with um, various outcomes, health and social outcomes at age in midlife with early life, early life mental health, there is some suggestive uh, evidence that this becomes stronger in more recently born cohorts. There was a similar suggestive, uh, a bit less so than in this paper on the alcohol problematic drinking behavior paper. And there's more work that has been done in the earlier cohort on how this association may be changing the mental, mental health with various outcomes and so on. Um, Last thing on, uh, on not, not exactly last, but last slide on, or almost last slide on early life mental health. This is ongoing work on various cohorts uh, on inequalities in early life mental health, led by Owen McElroy. And this is work, what you see here is various early life mental health externalizing, internalizing at age 10 and 11, four cohorts, 1958, the NCDS, 1970, BCS70, ALSPAC, and the Millennium cohort with various indicators of early life socioeconomic position. So paternal education, housing tenure, maternal education, this says SCP, but is paternal social class. This, this is internalizing and this is externalizing. What you see in internalizing, nothing much happens in the three, up until ALSPAC, up until the 90s, but in the millennium cohort, we were picking up an association, some increase in inequality which is much more pre much stronger when it comes to housing. Uh, so housing plays an important role. In externalizing, the pattern is a bit more, there isn't a very clear pattern. However, in housing, again, the millennium cohort does worse. There's a much stronger coefficient when it comes to housing. Now, this, this finding about inequalities across cohorts, what happens in the national difference and the importance of housing is linked very well with a paper we published recently on parental wealth and children's cognitive ability, mental health and physical health in the millennium cohort, where we actually found that it's housing wealth, which has the most important association, well-adjusted association with uh, early life mental health in the millennium cohort. So it's related with that uh, form of inequality we're picking up on that uh, paper that uh, ongoing work which compares various generations. Um, the last bit of the presentation uh, before Dario takes over with uh, what I think is the most interesting stuff. Obviously in the cohort, it's not only about early life stuff, early life mental health and stuff in the future. It's about trajectories, understanding life course trajectories of various things, in this case, mental health. So this is a paper that was published recently on the life course trajectory of psychological distress, life course, adulthood through early old age. And is the very first paper that actually gives very strong evidence with longitudinal data, birth cohort data on the fact that midlife is a period of that of increased stress or increased stress and increased psychological distress. Up until now, it was this information was either from cross-sectional data or longitudinal surveys that, that had to create pseudo cohorts that make some additional modeling assumptions. 
What is interesting about when you have all these cohorts is that you don't need a lot of models to see age period and cohort effects. So if you see the same plot, but have calendar year in the X axis, you see we're picking the same effect, but then you can see, okay, hold on. If this looks like an age effect, maybe not a period effect because we're picking up this increase in mental health in different periods, maybe with an ex exception here. So without even doing an age period cohort model with all the assumptions that you have to make on this, by simply plotting all these great interesting data, of course there are difficulties there, right? How to harmonize and, and, and so on. But by simply plotting these trajectories, you can, we can understand whether this is more an age, a period or a cohort effect. In this case, it's mostly an age and some cohort effect depending on uh, which, uh, effect we're looking at. And I think I think this is this is again a unique, unique strength of having birth cohort data of over the life course. Obviously the population average trajectory is one thing, but one of the other interesting thing we can do in the cohorts, and that has been done the, the very first paper that the trajectories was in the 1946 cohort that we did that in you know almost 15 years ago now, so a long time ago. But this latest evidence from BCA70, these are some trajectories on BCA70. So you can see there is heterogeneity there. It's not right or wrong, right? It's answering a different question when we pick up this heterogeneity compared to the average of population trajectory. As you will see here, we're picking up five different groups, absence of symptoms, and then various other groups, midlife onset, early life onset, uh, on you know persistent se severe symptoms and so on. Now, the important thing is that, of course, we can use this as an outcome. What I'm going to show you is how we use these life course histories of mental health in, we have done this in various cohorts, but in this particular cohort to relate this with outcomes during the pandemic. So this is uh, loneliness uh, during lockdown, during the first lockdown. The reference group is always the, the group that with no symptoms over their, over their life course. You will see that all the other groups, early onset favorable outcomes, midlife onset, severe outcomes or severe symptoms and so on, there, there is an increased risk of loneliness. Um, and this is, the take home message here, this, this, is, this is not depending on the onset of symptoms or the duration and so on. No matter what happened, there is all in, as long as someone has experienced mental health symptoms at some point in their life course, this has translated to increased risk of, of loneliness. Similar picture with um, psychological distress um, and uh, 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 Pay, payment, holiday pay, payments on getting, a, let's say, a, a holiday in your payment during lockdown, or payments like something like a mortgage, which is a kind of economic type of outcome. Uh, with one exception, again, we're picking up increased risk with no matter the onset or the duration of, of uh, when uh, mental health symptoms were first experienced and so on. So this life course heterogeneity allows us to understand something during the pandemic. Um, moving on, what happened during the pandemic before Dario uh, takes over. Um, this is uh, depression, anxiety, loneliness, and low life satisfaction prevalences in the four cohorts uh, from age 62, the oldest cohort to age 19, the millennium cohort, during the first, uh, the, during the first lockdown, really, that was our first web survey. You will see that there is a clear generational gradient in all those uh, outcomes, depression, anxiety, loneliness, and low life satisfaction with again, the finding that it comes, you, you know, uh, it's a kind of consistent finding the millennium cohort reports the worst outcomes in all of those, uh, in all of those different dimensions of mental health and well-being uh, during the pandemic. Last slide um, before Dario takes over. This is part of uh, an initiative we are involved in and leading at, at CLS. Uh, it's called the National Core Studies, which brings together various uh, studies to understand the impact of the pandemic. What we have here is meta-analysis on various cohorts on employment status disruption and mental health during the pandemic. So th the reference group here is those that were employed prior and during the pandemic. You have three groups, uh, those that were furloughed, the, the, our focus is on furlough um, because Fellow, it's an important policy scheme. About 11 million people were furloughed up until March 2021. So it's important and an important social shift. We want to understand whether it was an association with mental health and other outcomes. So furlough, those with job loss, people that lost their job during the pandemic and stable unemployment. You see that we're not picking up great differences with those that were furloughed. Nothing on anxiety, maybe some uh, elevated risk 
for uh, low, low life satisfaction and depression, just to say that these, these risk ratios are adjusted for various pre-pandemic so demographic characteristics and early life and pre-pandemic mental health. So they represent onset of mental health symptoms during the pandemic. However, stable unemployment and job loss during the pandemic uh, has a bit more risk uh, compared to those in stable employment. The take home message is, and we're picking up this in various other outcomes we're looking at, health behaviors and so on, is that the furlough scheme seems to be protective. So you can think of it as a welfare state type of policy, which is protective. So I'll stop here and Dario will uh, take over with a very, a very, very interesting hot of the press type of data. So let me find the right button and stop sharing. I'll do that. And Dario, floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> now again, the, the, that moment where I have to share the screen. Um, can you confirm if you can see this? Properly? Yes, I can see. I can see. I can see it, Dario. I can see it. Nice. Perfect. So thank you very much um, for attending, and thank you very much for staying up to this point. I'm uh, Dario Moreno. I'm a research fellow in population mental health. I'm working at both the Center for Society Mental Health and the Center for Longitudinal Studies with both uh, George and, and Jay from the King's College London. And uh, yeah, we're studying mental health outcomes over time, focusing on potential inequalities in these outcomes. So I'm going to show some of the mm, recent findings. Uh, these are actually ongoing studies that are focused on somewhat similar issues, but with somewhat different perspectives. So without further ado, this is the first of these two studies is a life course approach to distress. And it builds upon the previous work that George has uh, presented previously, where they focused on the life course of, uh, trajectories of distress in the adult cohorts in the UK. Um, the aim of this, um, of this study is actually to, to extend it to include the information we now have from the COVID surveys, uh, not only to extend the evidence we have on these uh, trajectories longitudinally, but also to have some um, information on what the potential impact of the pandemic has been on these trajectories, having that possibility of situation uh, of situating that, that evidence in the, in the previous information we have from the whole uh, trajectories. So I'm going to show now some descriptive trajectories uh, that have been recently, uh, I've, I've been working on recently. And you will see that they are similar to something that uh, George presented previously, because it's actually a, an extension of that. So these are the, um, the, um, the trajectories, the descriptive trajectories, and you can see that they are the mean number of symptoms according to the male symmetry which is an item uh, an inventory that includes several experiences of distress, including feeling miserable, depressed, worried, irritated, or nervous. You can see these uh, points are the mean estimates along with the 95% confidence in intervals that in the case of the three last points are weighted for the non-response in the, in the COVID survey, um, in the COVID survey ways, because we know uh, that there was uh, some effect, as George mentioned in the presentation before. Um, one thing that you can see now clearly is when we use the age as the x-axis, we can see that these two lines are relatively parallel somehow, but that the members of the BCS cohort, those uh, from 1970, uh, have uh, substantially higher levels of distress throughout the whole period of time. This is consistent with what we, uh, we already know. But probably that is not what caught your eye from the first uh, time when you saw this graph, and it's probably what is happening on the on the right hand side of the of the graphic. If we change that, as as George mentioned also before, these are descriptive data, so it's that we don't need actually to make great um, analysis to to actually check some of the relevant to have some relevant insights. If we switch that x-axis to be the calendar year we can see that there is something happening here on the on the right hand side of the graph. And this is the, the effect of the, the, the COVID pandemic. We can see uh, these three last time points correspond to the to the COVID pandemic surveys. Um, and we call this the upper cut because uh, we can see that from the first to the second time points of the COVID uh, surveys, we, we see a, a, a 
tremendous increase in the mean number of symptoms according to the malesimum tree. We see also that from the second to the third time points, there is a, a, a decrease that is a, something less than half of the increase that we already observed. And we want to extend these kind of analysis to be also the oldest uh, cohort, the NSHD cohort. Uh, currently, this is not included here because we recently submitted the data request for that, um, for, for including that data. Um, one of the main um, attractives of these um, nice things of this kind of approach in this context is that we can not only know that there's a, um, on average a great increase from the first to the second time point of the, of the COVID part, uh, uh, service, but also we can see that con considering that we have the information, the previous information from these uh, two cohorts, we can see that those points are the highest points of, um, of distress in both of these, uh, uh, in both of these cohorts. So this allows us to situate that kind of information in, in, the, in the biographical history of these two cohorts. The second of the studies is slightly different, is uh, more generally focused on different mental health measures, including uh, life satisfaction, uh, loneliness, anxiety, and depression, and also it's aimed at additional cohorts, um, the, um, the four CLS ongoing cohort studies and also the NSHD, but I'm not going to show anything on the NSHD because as I said before, we recently submitted data request for that um, data. Remember that the three last time points, the three COVID pandemic uh, surveys were, the, the waves were spaced around like five months apart and I'm going to show now a graphic depicting the mean levels of loneliness according to the, the main measure of loneliness that we have in that, uh, in that study, that is the UCLA three item uh, scale on loneliness. We can see here the, the results by the cohort. And again, these points represent, and the points in the 95% confidence interval represent um, the mean levels of loneliness, but these are weighted by non-response in the case of the uh, NCDS and the BCS uh, cohorts, but also in the next step study and the millennium cohort study, these weights are also uh, including the survey weights. All the information on how these uh, weights are, are derived is included in the uh, CLS uh, website, and we can share that uh, URL with you uh, if you're interested. Um, but it's publicly available. <laughs> um, so one thing that we can already see when, when, when we see that uh, information uh, on loneliness is, as, as we already kind of know, that there is a clear age cohort um, differences and average in the levels of loneliness with those um, younger participants having substantially in higher levels of those older. And that rank ordering of the, on, on age or cohort, we can see that is somehow kept over time is uh, the same ordering um, in terms of, of loneliness. But of course, another thing we can see here is that, that the distance between those different points is not the same over time. And uh, this is hinting at potential age cohort by period differences. This is the mean levels of, in this case, loneliness are not changing at the same rate for all different cohorts. We can see, for instance, here that the members of the next steps uh, study uh, present a, a relatively um, steeper increase than the other two, um, than the older uh, cohorts from the second to the third uh, time points, which uh, roughly correspond to the almost beginning of the second lockdown uh, in the UK and during the, the second lockdown, which was um, where the when the, the possibilities for social interactions were restricted intensely. Um, on the other hand, we can see that the Millennium Cohort study members uh, stay relatively stable over time, even if they have substantially higher levels of, of loneliness during the whole three time points in the pandemic. Um, however, there's something relevant here as well that we may have, uh, we could have just summarized all this information in just three time point summarizing all the information from all the four cohorts and we would have had a, a single uh, line 
connecting those two real time points, but we would have uh, lost some granularity and some, some relevant differences that we can observe now between the different cohorts. And that is actually potential, that, that is probably happening also within the cohorts. So right now we are just looking at single lines within those cohorts. We want to explore, to extend this kind of uh, analysis to allow to, to, to explore for potential heterogeneity within in these mental health outcomes within those cohorts. And for instance, one of those that I'm going to show now is the uh, levels of loneliness again, but now by the different levels of financial situation reported um, pre-COVID. So this is the, the, the how well they, uh, the participants were doing financially before the uh, before the pandemic started and we can see again now that there are some important relevant uh, differences in in those mean levels we can see that those uh, participants doing worse relatively worse financially show consistently higher levels of of loneliness uh, at the three time points whereas those that are doing better um, that were doing better before the pandemic have substantially lower levels of loneliness. But additionally, we can see that the, the, the way in which these average uh, um, levels of loneliness change over time is not exactly equivalent across the different, um, uh, the different um, subgroups and also within the same cohort across, uh, across the different levels of financial status. So we can see, for instance, here that uh, even if the overall, so to speak, trajectory uh, we were observing for the Millennium Cohort Study members was relatively stable. We may not have that kind of, that level of stability if we look to, uh, if, if we actually uh, account for potential heterogeneity within those uh, levels. Again, this is ongoing work. And of course, we need to account for the fact that these are um, probably not super stable um, results, especially within the lowest, um, the, the group showing the experiencing difficulties financially because the, sum, the, the amount of uh, participants that are within those uh, this uh, specific group is relatively smaller. And also it entails several different groups that are experiencing difficulties but at potential different levels. We want to extend this kind of analysis to account for additional relevant variables, including the birth sex, uh, also the social network characteristics, geographical context, uh, context characteristics, and even ethnicity in, in those um, cohorts that have uh, some ethnic diversity, which are particularly the, the next step study and the millennium cohort study. Um, and we consider that doing this kind of analysis is uh, exciting in a way that will provide some evidence um, on, on potential pre-existing and also new inequalities that may have occurred during the pandemic in the, in the levels of mental health within the population. So thank you very much for your attention. This is the end of my presentation and uh, over to you, George, uh, for, for this, uh, mm, the summary. I will keep sharing my screen. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Dario. So yeah, so we'll be doing the Chris Witte Patrick Valance thing, right? So the, <laughs> thank you, Dario. Um, so just so, then Dario will we'll do this together. I mean, so to summarize the whole thing, I think you have seen that it's a very, very exciting um, recent data uh, from Dario. So just to summarize what we talked about today, I think the first bit is about measurement that potential source of bias such as AIDS effect, survey design, which is important. They may, it might differ within and between cohorts period effects, cohort specific effects and so on, do not influence the way participants interpret and respond to mental health items. And that's very important because that gives us um, a very strong and robust basis to compare between cohorts, do trajectories and so on. Um, it's not a given, as I say, because there are various sources of measurement error that could have uh, made this not possible. Um, it's not always perfect. There are, difference for, there are differences, for example, we're not always picking up exactly the same results with various methods, but broadly speaking, Mental health measures were very, very, very happy to find that actually that mental health measures have very fair, favorable measurement properties um, in, the, in, the, in the cohorts and you know, understanding those will help substantive research. 
Now, I have a list of examples of work of research that are much more than that, as there is much more work that is going on in the cohorts than what I, that the very, very, um, you know, uh, sub brief summary that I discussed today. But of course, we can do work on antecedents and consequences of mental health over the life course. And again, this research is largely possible because of the properties, the measuring properties of the mental health measures. We can do profiles and trajectories. Um, they investigate the resilience and vulnerability processes, gene environment interactions, related type of work, and so on. Um, generational differences, macrosocial trends, demographic see, social change, and how those impact on mental health, which is of strong interest of mine as well, among other things, and hopefully a strong interest of you too, because I think it's a very important area where the cohorts can massively contribute to our understanding of social change and mental health and so on. Um, what I think what we, we are seeing from this work, this early work that I um, that I presented, and that on life course mental health histories, for example, that work is, which is led from my, my colleague Vanessa Mudon from CLS, is that life course mental health histories during the pandemic uh, shape various outcomes uh, during the pandemic, and perhaps are expected to influence post-pandemic outcomes. And this is a strength of the cohorts, right? That we are able to actually identify this, and this is very policy relevant because we will be able to identify more resilient or more vulnerable groups and so on or in the future. And generally, and this, I think interventions to improve mental health and especially more recently born cohorts may be key to post-pandemic uh, recovery. That's something I can discuss on, but I think the emerging evidence we get from the cohorts and, other, and others and other uh, sources, I think all kind of are converging to this, that post-pandemic mental health will be key on various aspects of post-pandemic recovery. And I think we have one more slide, Dario, don't we? Yes, and this, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for both me and Dario, did I forget anything on the summary? Is there anything you would like to add? No. <laughs> no? Okay, so thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. These are both our email address and neutral handles for questions, suggestions, and so on. And uh, me and Dario uh, are very happy to answer questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, George. And, and thank you, Dario. It's, it's a really fantastic and wonderful overview. And, such an incredible set of resources um, and, and very useful to know how to, to access those. And I think especially for the center, um, very useful to know about the mental health measures and their properties and so on. And, and, and nice to end with uh, opportunities for analysis, because I think that will be what a lot of people who are, uh, have joined will be interested in and what it is that they can themselves look at. Um, so we have plenty of time for questions, which is great. I see that there's some questions in the chat. Um, and a couple of questions that have gone in um, a little bit uh, long, and I wonder actually whether it's better for people to unmute and ask questions. So, um, and if you don't and don't feel comfortable doing that, then I'm more than happy to read out the question, but Katrina first, I don't know if you are able to unmute and ask your question. Um, I'm here, there's a dog barking in the background that you will have to excuse. Um, sure, so no I'm problem. I know that um, you've been using um, measures of mental distress, and I can see some advantages of doing that. Um, but I'm more used to using um, measures that kind of proxy clinical disorders, such as um, using PHG-9, say, to look at depression, uh, and GAD-7 to look at um, generalised anxiety disorder. So I wondered what you thought about the kind of relative strengths of the two approaches and whether it's whether you consider it a weakness of these longitudinal um, cohorts that they don't have these proxies to clinical disorders. Dario, should I have a go first or do you want to go first, Dario? Well, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for the question. I think it's a very important, interesting question. Just to say, um, we actually do have versions of the GAD and the PHQ, the PHQ2 and the GAD2, and also the Malays, for example, you can also get a case in a threshold. Um, so as an approximation to clinical disorder, and the same for the GHQ12 and so on, the GHQ12, 28, which are also available at various sweeps of various of the cohorts. We also have the CISR available in one of our sweeps. Now, Generally, in all the measures we have, with some minor exemptions, we can, we can get a caseness, a threshold criterion, if this is desirable. I think it depends on the question at hand. I mean, from a, you know, from a population science demography perspective, or, or when you're gonna do something which is more on that end of things, 
having a continuum or something which gives you variation across the population may be of interest. In other questions, it might be you, you can have a specific threshold. All these measures have validated thresholds. They are, I wouldn't call them, with the exception of the CISR, I wouldn't call them clinical measures though. And, and maybe that's my ignorance. I wouldn't think of the GAD or the PHQR clinical measures as well, despite having the, them having a threshold. The short answer is both, you can do both in the cohorts. It depends on the question at hand. Um, something that can make things slightly more complicated. If you have, if you have different measures and you're using the threshold, the caseness approach, more measurement assumptions are needed compared to when you're using a continuum of those measures. There is a lot of information on that on various of the papers we have published. I don't know if I have the time to get into this. It's an interesting uh, discussion. But the short answer is both are available. It depends on the question at hand, I think. And depends on the measurement assumptions one we're willing to make for a particular question at hand. Thanks very much, George. Um, and uh, to, to Mauricio, who says he has a, a boring um, technical methodological question, but that, ne never my boring favorite question. Answer, right? <laughs> no, 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 so no, And I'll come to, to Louise. Mauricio, do you want to, if you can unmute, otherwise I'm happy to read out your question. Hello. Hi, George. Hi, Dario. Thanks right. so much Hi, for the presentation. Nice to see you again. Uh, the question is basically, uh, I say it boring because it's, it's de dealt with specifically method on measurement invariance. So for longitudinal measurement invariance, I, I read your papers with Hugo, for example, right? Where you measured differences in Malays, I think it was Malays, uh, in, in two cohorts, right? So th there is, uh, my question is if time invariance, like longitudinal invariance, you how bad is it you modeling those time points as if they are groups, right? Or do if you use like that, if you do like that, or if you don't use such another methods to, such as proposed by Liu, which uh, make like the measurement model by each time, and then you restrict thresholds, factor loadings, and intercepts to be the same across the measurement uh, models. I don't know if, if my question was clear enough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dario, should I should I go first? Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you so much. It's it's a it's a very so very very interesting and important question. The short answer is we did both. Uh, we published the grouping approach because it's more restrictive, more conservative, uh, in the sense that time is not a, is not a, is not a characteristic of the model, but because of the nature of the data and how the groups are derived. The, the groups are compared across time as well. So in a, at the end of the day, you might have, depending on the, how many sweeps, you have 24 groups, right? The fact that we were, we were able to obtain fixed effects invariance, not random effects invariance, because when you do it via time, you may also add, add the random effect component on the invariance. The fact that we're picking, we, we have scalar invariance with fixed effects invariance, with fixed groups, it's even more conservative, I think. So I think that was good news. It also holds with the, with, with the other approach, when you bring in the random effect, if the, which I think is, is the one is the one you mentioned, but in terms of substantive interpretation, it doesn't change the substantive interpretation, which is what's good news, despite all these time differences and the different sources of potential sources of error. Um, scalar invariance held. I can think of situations where the, these two things will be different, uh, especially when you have a, a large number of groups, or, which means in this case, large number of time points, and within cohort groups, when you bring more things. In this case, we went for fixed effects, effects invariance. In our view, is the most conservative one. But yeah, uh, yeah, we can. Uh, it worked. With, it worked with the longitudinal element. But you know, we, we opted for the more conservative approach. Thanks, George and uh, Louise. I don't know if you're able to to unmute. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, thank you. It's, it was a, absolutely fantastic. Um, lovely to see you both. Um, great presentation. Um, you probably kind of have presented that, Dario. Uh, I had to leave for a few minutes, so maybe I just completely missed it. I just wondered about the... Um, the I was fascinated by your um, um, trajectories of loneliness in different age group, and I wondered whether you have parallel or associated trajectories for mental health problems, like um, probably kind of psychological distress. So are these kind of two trajectories kind of um, have the same shape? So in a way, can we make a link between those trajectories of loneliness and trajectories of psychological distress, for example? Uh, 
Uh, thank you for the question. I haven't presented every uh, thing <laughs> that we have been with because of the limit, time limitations. And, and yeah, I've just uh, shown the, the loneliness one. Uh, but uh, the aim of the second study is actually to extend it to, and, and we are currently doing it, uh -huh. uh, to extend it to also life satisfaction, uh, mm -hmm. anxiety with, measured with the GAD2, and, mm -hmm. and depression measured with the G, uh, PHQ2. And and the 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 ways in which those those um, by by this time they are descriptive trajectories. The way in which they they look is not exactly the same across the different uh, measures. And for instance, with the life satisfaction, I'm I'm I have a terrible memory. So <laughs> this is me just uh, trying to dig that from my memory, which could be absolutely wrong. But um, uh, for instance, with life satisfaction, we observe uh, more uh, like declining uh, patterns than than for um, the um, loneliness ones that seem to be a little bit more affected by the fact that there was some sort of like um, intermission yeah. in that second COVID survey because the second one happened before almost at the very beginning of the second lockdown, yeah. and therefore some of those results. You, something can be seen like clearly that the, the social restric restrictions are are clearly somehow having that uh, impact in in some variables and not in others but yes interesting okay i look well i look forward to kind of uh, hear more about those findings yeah thank you thank you thank you louise thanks. Thanks so much thanks. yeah thanks louise and, and thanks dario um, could, could I ask a, a question, um, which I guess is a specific question and a, and a general question, so maybe in kind of two parts. So in your um, slides, Dario, you, you talked about the up, uh, uppercut, I think it was, for the COVID. Um, and, I, and, I, and I guess what struck me is yet yeah, there was clearly a, a, an increase, but it's really a question about the, the magnitude and the, and the meaningfulness of that increase. And I guess, the, so the question then is how big of an increase in uh, say the malaise measure or, or other measures would would actually be a recognizable change in 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 how someone feels, and and then I guess that's a general question. Um, when we use these sorts of measures, of course we set some kind of standard for a statistically important uh, change, but we 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 don't really ever preset what we might consider to be a meaningful change, a change that would actually be, you know, noticeable in someone's kind of daily life, daily function, and so on. And, and so, the, so the, the specific question about the COVID, but but the general question being, should we should we do that? Should we be setting for each of the measures and have some kind of criteria that says this amount of change is a meaningful change? Because you increase the sample, you'll find a significant difference statistically. But does it matter? I think is the is the bigger question really. Well, thank you. Uh, I I really think that in this case, in this particular case of the uh, uh, life course approach to distress. Uh, this is uh, building upon the previous work, and then one of the, the, the features of the Malay symmetry is that across the NCDS and the BCS, the, the, like, uh, the measurement invariance also, even at, at some level that is like higher, where, where you can actually compare like the, yeah, the mean number of symptoms in this case, right? And, and I think that one of the nice features of, of the richness of this data is that sometimes it's, it's just like, Loading the data will show you, in a way, what the. Uh, if, I mean, we don't know. The, is this? Um, the, this is not talking about the threshold. It's not representing any. Like uh, we are crossing this threshold at this time, but we can see, for instance, that the. That those are the highest levels that we have ever observed, uh, for those participants uh, on average during the whole time that we have been uh, that, that they have been. Uh, followed up, which is a long time. So in this particular, um, in this the, where the uppercut happens, the the mean levels get to a to a point where they have never been before. And if we are also looking at the way at the pace of change, we can see clearly that there's a step up in that uh, in that um, in those trajectories. That is clearly something disrupting the. Um, well, this is arguable, of course, but there's clear uh, there's a clear step 
up uh, from the from the natural way in which those um, in, in which those lines were behaving previously. So I think that is one of the nice features of this approach that it is clearly see uh, watchable. You, you can f see it in the in the very data, and these are descriptive uh, data. So when we get to, I mean, we can get to the analytic part where we actually test if there's an interaction, if there's like a piecewise portion there happening. But at this time point, at this preliminary stage, we are looking at, at mean levels. And even in that way, we can observe already that there's some, some level of increase. Craig, may I add 10 seconds to uh, yeah, sure, please the, do, on, on the level, uh, I think on, 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 on the particular thing about what is the level, the meaning of level, level of difference, right? Because we're picking up, Dario is absolutely right, we're picking up seeing something that hasn't happened before, even worse than midlife, which um, it's difficult with those scales. I think this is related to the first question about thresholds, clinical meaning, meaningful thresholds and so on, right? But again, exactly how they are derived and with rock curves and so on. I think it's a bit difficult as Darius suggested, having the relative understanding what happened during the life course give us a relative picture. But saying, for example, one unit increase, one point increase, right, in the malaise is meaningful for the population or clinically meaningful, which are two different things. I think it's difficult for any of those scales. So I wouldn't, I, I would, and it's not about, you know, p values and significance levels and so on, but being able to say that this shift is very important for what. However, one thing I might say is that when we were, we picked up this in, that the 1970 cohort do worse in midlife. They, they have the same, they do worse. I mean, no matter how, how you look at it in terms of prevalence or the latent level and so on, it, there's, then if you think about in terms of standard deviations, it's a bit more than more than half a standard deviation, which is a lot, right? In any kind of metric. But then what we also have to find out based on some, some work from Ditton and other work is that if you look at mortality in midlife, what is called death of despair is increasing in midlife in that cohort. So there is something which is population relevant that maps into something we observe population related data. So generally, I would try to look when we observe shifts, I would try to look for external information, which should be related in some way to uh, that in, if, if we're observing an increase on mental health and so on. Thanks very much, George, and, and thanks very much, Dario. Um, I'm, I'm trying to keep track of the uh, of the chat. I don't know, Paul, if your um, comment is a question or if you would like to to unmute and make your point. Uh, sorry, yeah, because there's so much text, I'm finding it hard to read everything. So yeah, sorry, yeah, you should ahead. never give me permission to talk because <laughs> I'm coming at it from a, oh, that's an interesting place. Um, I was just, I propose the question of, of how do you know when there's a significant change? My pragmatic, and, I, and I've written it in the chat box so people can read, my day job's HR, my, I'm a public governor for a mental health trust, which is why I've signed on because it's really relevant. And it, I've, I've absolutely, I'm really clear that everybody with whom I work, whether it's a public governor responding to requests for help um, with the quality report, or whether it's the employees for whom I give advice or to whom I give advice to their managers, everybody is crankier. And I was, I was trying to find a posh way of saying everybody's crankier, but, but that's the one. And I can see Katrina saying that everybody is distressed and, and it's making, I mean, I'm seeing it all in all aspects of life. Racism has gone up, um, transphobia has gone up, um, gender issues have become nastier. There's all the trolls on Twitter and, and so on. And so if, 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 I'm, if I'm correct in assuming that a considerable proportion of the population have some underlying issues with being jittery or um, anxiety or depressed, and, and all of that has been exacerbated, and, and so, in, in a way, we're all trying to deal with people who aren't responding as they previously did. I, I suppose that's where I'm trying to go. Now, that, that's absolutely the case for the mental health outpatients and inpatients that we're seeing at the Trust. Um, when they finally do present, it's far more acute in the sense of serious, where before it was, I don't know, personality disorder, and, and now it, it's tipped over into something more extreme. And, and my fear is that it's also becoming chronic in the sense of the outpatients and inpatients. So people are coming into wards with a higher level of acuity. Um, and, and, and so I'm seeing it right across the spectrum from, um, oh, sorry, I, I didn't, I should have undone my camera. 
Um, but I'm saying right across the spectrum from people in work who 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 have, have come back to work and so forth, but right the way through to mental health patients, sorry, service users. Thanks, thanks very much, Paula. That's very helpful. Um, I don't know if George or, or, or Daryl wanted to come back on that, or Katrina, whether you wanted to come in in relation to your comment. I think just unmute if, uh, if so. Okay, any, any final questions that anyone has? We're almost out of time, but do have a minute or two if there are any final questions. But if not, um, then I guess just uh, to say thank you. Thank you to you all for coming along. Thank you to um, George, Dario in particular for such a really, it was such a wonderful wide ranging topic, which I think will have inspired a lot of interest in working with the cohort data and given some really strong examples of what is possible with the cohort data. And uh, hopefully you're not gonna now be too inundated with people requesting um, how you access data and the kind of questions that you can ask. But I guess ultimately that would be a, a good thing. Um, but so thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, George. Thank you, Dario. And hope to see you soon at the next seminar. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you, everybody. for, for uh, And if you have questions, please uh, ask us questions and download the data. Use the data. They're freely available. Please download the data. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, George. Thanks, Dario. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.